The Arctic is a tough place to operate in. Warming sea temperatures are causing the loss of ice cover in the Arctic in the summer months. And that's opened the Arctic up to increased shipping activity, increased other economic activity, like energy exploration. I'm Roger Roof. I'm a retired Coast Guard Vice Admiral. So yeah, I think shipping is going to continue to increase dramatically over the next several years. And it's probably not at a critical point yet, but it's close to that. The Kulik was a shell oil rig that was being towed for maintenance. And it was countered some heavy weather, not untypical for that time of year. And the, the tow line parted. The vessel went aground, and the 18 people aboard had to be rescued by Coast Guard helicopter. Kulik incident revealed that if you're going to pursue economic activity uh, in the Arctic, you have to be prepared for it. And you can't just assume that if you have experience in the Gulf of Mexico, that that transfers automatically to the Arctic. It's a challenging environment because of severe weather that we encounter routinely in that part of the world. It is also a very diverse and resilient and fragile ecosystem. The Bering Strait has species that we don't find anywhere else in the United States. My name is Marilyn Hyman. I'm the U.S. Arctic Program Director for the Pew Charitable Trusts. The Yupik and Inupiat people have lived there for time and memoriam, living off of the ocean, really without much interference. And now with shipping, we're having much more impact to that, that ecosystem and those people and their way of life. Oil spills can happen. Uh, you can have strikes of marine mammals. You can have interference with hunters who are in small boats that those large vessels don't even know are there. So there are lots of concerns about increased shipping. And what we would like to see is a much more sustainable approach that um, will not impact this ecosystem. Bering Strait is a, a pinch between the Pacific and the whole Arctic. My name is Kate Stafford, and I'm an oceanographer at the University of Washington. So it's this very narrow bottleneck through which a mass migration of animals passes twice a year. Sound is actually the most important sense for marine mammals. They really rely on sound to navigate, to find food, as a reproductive display and, and to keep together. What I do is I put an instrument called a hydrophone underwater and we leave it there for about a year. And that hydrophone or underwater microphone records all the sounds in the ocean. It records seals, it records whales, it records ship passages. It records oil and gas seismics. When you increase noise in the ocean, whether that's from something like a storm and wind or whether that's from a ship passage, it reduces the space over which animals can detect sounds, detect each other, and over which they can communicate. And that has the potential to, to really impact how they migrate and how they find food. We just need to figure out how to mitigate it as best we can because everybody's coming up to stake their claim in the Arctic. And without good international regulation and cooperation, it, it's gonna be like the Wild West. How we survive here is really the tug and barge industry. I'm Ed Page, I'm the executive director for the Marine Exchange of Alaska, which is located in Juneau. We have tugs and barges come up here and delivering our groceries, our fuel. These are very rich fishery grounds. If you're in Alaska, they say, get a beater car, but a good boat. The job of the Marine Exchange is, is exchange maritime information to help make good decisions. This is the Marine Exchange's 24-hour operation center. These dots represent the 100 receiving sites. And what they're receiving is transmissions from vessels. And every couple seconds, they're sending out data on the name of the vessel, course, speed, type of cargo. Okay, and this is what I refer to as the Maritime I-5. Beforehand, when vessels cast off, they kind of disappeared over the horizon, didn't seem to show up another port. And this is the Bering Strait. 
Now you see them all the time. And as a result, we can say this vessel is not allowed to go past 15 knots in this particular area because there's whales. And we can ensure they don't. And if they do, alarms go off and emails get sent. It's kind of like having a radar gun every 100 yards along the highway. What we developed was a portable transponder that could be put on a small boat. A large commercial vessel would see them every bit as clearly as a super tanker. Vessels are going to be going through the Arctic because it's an international body of water. So if they're going to go through there, determine what the area's concern are, and then implementing through technology measures that can actually ensure the vessels are towing the line. I think most people realize that Alaska really is the last frontier. Uh, what they probably don't realize is that the maritime frontier that's suddenly opening up, it's a sensitive region, and it's an area that we want to protect. There has to be a balance. I'm not opposed to activity in the Arctic. It's coming, but uh, we've got to have appropriate protections in place to ensure that this very rich, diverse, intact ecosystem is preserved. And so what we need to do is define those regions and time of year that are most important to the animals and then make recommendations. Shipping lanes have been moved. Ships have been asked to slow down. Maybe there are some times when you don't allow any shipping. I think the next step is starting to get some very specific traffic lanes that will keep the vessels out of important ecological areas. The Coast Guard and the federal government need to really listen to the communities about what they need and what they want. And they need to be a part of the dialogue, the people who live there, who hunt, who have you know, lived in this incredible place.